What's going on, Space Monkeys? Welcome to Political Fight Club. I'm Robert Durden. We're going to continue with Dreamland today. Had a few minutes to spare on this dreary day. Uh, thought we'd do a chapter. This is called A Tidal Wave Forming. It's chapter 43, page 232. Olympia, Washington. Jennifer Sable felt like she was sinking. The epidemiologist for the state of Washington stood before a room full of 14 prominent doctors at Seattle's Warwick Hotel one cold night in December 2005. Jamie Mai and Gary Franklin from the state's labor and industries had visited her a year before asking if the opiate overdose deaths among disabled workers were also happening in the state's general population. Sable and her team pulled together all the death certificates and coroner's reports of people who died from opiates. It was a complicated task, identifying potential deaths for each year, then requesting the paperwork on each from coroners around the state. Now she was presenting her findings to a collection of some of Washington's top pain specialists. She kept her eyes on the slides as she spoke. We've had dramatic increases in the numbers of opiate overdose deaths, she said, speaking to the screen. 24 in 1995. Her pointer followed the graph as it shot up. In 2004, we found 386 people died of opioid overdoses statewide, a 16-fold increase. She went on, detailing some of the cases from each year. Finally, Sable turned to face her audience. The room was silent. This couldn't be true, said one doctor finally. There must have been some coding error, another said. Death certificates are notoriously unreliable, said a third. Others spoke skeptically of Sable's data. The message was clear. Several doctors in the room did not believe her. Sable grew queasy, trying to defend the data, but aware that she was new to the issue. What am I doing here, she thought. How did I get into this? Gary Franklin jumped in to help. This is similar to what we found at the LNI, and I think there's really something here, he told the specialists. Sable sat in silence. This group of physicians, she said when we met in 2013, they've been convinced by the drug companies that it's okay to prescribe these medications for people with chronic pain because here's the studies that show very few of them will become addicted. They don't want to hear that the people they're prescribing these drugs to might die. They're physicians and they're trying to help people. Sitting near Sable that night, Jamie Mai also couldn't believe what the doctors were saying. Four years had passed since Mai first saw those death reports of workers overdosing on the opiate painkillers they were taking for low back pain and carpal tunnel syndrome. Worker overdose deaths from opiates climbed each year. Mai's backyard rose garden grew ornate as amid expanding death cases she tended it relentlessly to relieve the stress. Sable's statewide figure showed a tidal wave forming out in the distance. Overdose deaths, Mai knew, now far outstripped those during the crack rage in the late 80s and even those when heroin was last popular, the mid-70s. Overdose deaths advanced in lockstep with the amount of opiates prescribed statewide. These were not pills stolen in pharmacy holdups. The size of the problem could only come from overprescribing. Mai said, We couldn't believe the volume, the number of cases. You're looking at the whole state and potentially the whole nation. The idea took us a couple of days to wrap our arms around. This is a huge problem, and it's just going to increase every year unless we do something about it. L and I came up with a guideline for general practitioners when prescribing these drugs. It went like this. If doctors had patients taking more than 120 milligrams a day with no reduction in pain, then they should stop and get a pain specialist's opinion before prescribing higher doses. It was simple and reasonable enough, particularly in light of the new overdose deaths among workers. But it was contrary to an idea central to the pain revolution, that there was no limit on how much opiate painkiller patients might be prescribed. The guideline Mai and Franklin were proposing would make Washington the first in the country to even suggest some control on how many narcotic pills doctors were prescribing. They could almost hear the criticism if they did this on their own. Government is going overboard, meddling in medicine, taking away our rights. So they brought together some of the state's, state's top pain specialists that night at the Warwick Hotel. We asked them, Sable said, this is your specialty. At what dose do you say, I need to step back and reevaluate this patient because this may not be working? As rough as the Warwick Hotel meeting was for Jennifer Sable, 
the pain specialists came around. In later meetings, they themselves suggested that L and I put out guidelines for prescribers suggesting limits, and that not every increase in pain should be met with higher doses of narcotics. Yet before those guidelines could be issued, Franklin got a, better, a letter from the Purdue Pharma executives. They objected to the idea of sealing on opiate doses. Limiting the access to opioids for people in chronic pain is not the answer, wrote Lally Samuel and Dr. J. David Haddox in 2007 in a letter. Haddox is the co-author of the concept of pseudo-addiction and was now working for the drug manufacturer. One three-year study of 219 patients with arthritis and low back pain performed by Russell Portnoy and seven other researchers at Beth Israel, they wrote, found patients taking 293 milligrams of OxyContin a day without any problems. They were concerned, Samuel and Haddox wrote, that patients needing more opi opiates may, quote, be undertreated while they are waiting for consultations with pain specialists as required by the guideline. Not long after that, a Spokane doctor named Merle Janus sued L and I. Dr. Janus was assisted by five law firms, four of which were from outside Washington state. The guideline they alleged in a court brief was an example of, quote, an extreme anti-opioid discriminatory animus or zealotry known as opiophobia that informs, permeates, and perniciously corrupts the development and management of public health policy in Washington. So LNI's prescribing guidelines hung in limbo for two years. 25 workers, each of whom had gone to a workers' comp doc with an injury, died of opiate overdoses in 08, 09, 32 more died. Nevertheless, the state of Washington, L and I, and that Warwick Hotel meeting, however, began a rethinking of the widespread use of prescription painkillers, the first reappraisal since the pain revolution had become conventional wisdom. It was rooted in my's investigation into these first worker overdose death reports in 2001. The paper she wrote with Franklin and Jennifer Sable's investigation into overdose deaths for the state, in turn, altered the CDC in Atlanta. Its epidemiologists began examining the death rates from opiate ODs nationwide. Epidemiologists would follow suit in the state of Ohio, where a few years back, or a few years earlier, black tar heroin had collided with aggressive pain pill prescribing and where the first pill mill emerged. In May 2011, meanwhile, a judge threw out Dr. Janus's lawsuit. The next year, Washington issued the guidelines on prescribing that Franklin and Mai had come up with, the first state to suggest doctors temper their opiate prescribing. Washington legislators also repealed the intractable pain regulations, allowing for unlimited dosing of opiates. I called Dr. Janus later to ask about his lawsuit and how he could afford to help the help of so many law firms. A secretary took my message and said that they were getting out of prescribing opiates for pain due to, quote, problems that the state was causing for doctors. Dr. Janus did not return my call. All right. We'll start the next chapter, Pentecostal Piety, Fierce Scratches, on page 236 next episode. And I hope you're enjoying the book, guys. We'll see you later.